Vladimir Putin grows louder. On Friday evening, Russian forces blockaded the port of Maripol, according to the mayor of the city. Russia also seized control of the Zaporizhia nuclear power station on Friday following a battle with Ukrainian forces. Russian shelling caused a fire near one of the reactors, which was extinguished before any radiation could escape. The U.S. Embassy in Ukraine is calling Russia's attack on the plant a war crime. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky is expected to speak with U.S. Senators Saturday morning. It will be the first chance for members of Congress to speak with him since Russia invaded. Lawmakers are currently considering a request for $10 billion in emergency funding to support humanitarian and security needs. Zelensky's meeting with U.S. lawmakers comes as Russian troops continue to advance through the country. Ukrainian officials report heavy fighting and civilian casualties in several major cities, and a massive Russian military convoy is now only about 15 miles from Ukraine's capital. For more on all of this, I want to bring in CBS News foreign correspondent Ian Lee. Ian, tell us what's the status of the Zaporizhia nuclear power station right now? Alana, a chilling video has emerged from last night when the power plant was under attack. Workers went on the PA system to say, stop shooting at a nuclear dangerous facility. Stop shooting immediately. You threaten the security of the whole world. And, and they aren't wrong. It's the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe. Fortunately, no radioactive leakage has been detected. The area is under control of Russian forces and the staff continue their jobs. The U.S. Embassy, as you said, is calling the attack on the plant a war crime. But this is a victory for Russia as the plant provides it's 25 percent of Ukraine's electricity. So, Ian, I mean, what you're describing, that that image of uh, the power plant and a PA system and, and, and the request, a plea to to stop the shelling sounds like something out of out of a major movie, a blockbuster. Why not only would Russia want to control this nuclear power plant, but but why were they willing to go to such lengths, particularly given the dangers of it, in order to control it? Yeah, I, I know. When you think about trying to fight around a nuclear power plant, that seems foolish because you're not only threatening your own lives, because if, if a rocket hits one of those, uh, those uh, reactors, it would kill the people around it, but it would also threaten the lives of people in the area and even people in Russia. So uh, it does seem quite foolish to do that. But, you know, controlling the electricity is going to be crucial for Russia. And this does provide 25 percent of Ukraine's electricity. And so turning on and turning off the lights, that's going to degrade Ukraine's ability to fight. And so that's why you see them going after a plant like this. So do we do we have any indication that Russia tactically is going to try and employ that that strategy, Ian, that they're going to try and strangle, have a stranglehold on Ukrainian citizens and the government by trying to control the energy in that way? Well, yeah, and you do see this in a lot of conflicts. Uh, we, we saw this uh, with Russia doing this in Syria, where you try to strangle cities so that nothing can go in, nothing can go out. Uh, you cut off the electricity. And so this way that the people really do suffer in that city and they try to lower the morale of the fighters inside the city. And so this is something that is a tactic that we've seen Russia use over and over again. And we're seeing it in Ukraine right now now. Ian, my, um, my producer, Heather, and I, before this, were going through all the different uh, nuclear power plants in Ukraine and, and, and looking at them on a map and where they were located. There are multiple uh, and, and many in, in areas that we know are, are being threatened by Russian troops right now. Are there safeguards to protect Ukraine's other nuclear plants? Well, Lana, Ukraine is asking for a roughly 20-mile buffer zone around all nuclear power plants, so there isn't a risk of an accident or some sort of shell landing in and destroying part of it. Uh, they don't want a repeat of what happened last night, which could have been catastrophic. Uh, and we saw them also take Chernobyl, and there is reports that there's increased radiation in the air around there. You know, right now, Ukrainian officials are also worried about the workers. It's a stressful environment operating a facility like that during a war, which increases the risk of human error. And that's just one of the reasons we're hearing President Zelensky repeatedly calling for a no-fly zone by NATO. But we know that isn't going to happen because they fear it could risk an even wider war. Yeah, we're 
we continue to watch uh, that situation. And I'm wondering, what do the Russian people know uh, about uh, what you and I are talking about right now, the, uh, the, the seizure of the plant, the, the situation on the ground? Because we know that Facebook and Twitter have been blocked for Russian citizens. Many foreign media outlets are also blocked. Uh, many of the independent stations within Russia, the independent media, have been forced out. So besides official state media, how are Russians getting their news? And, and, you know, that's something that the Kremlin is very keen on clamping down on any sort of independent news and any, any other way that they can't control that Russians are learning about this war. And that's because it isn't going the way Russia wanted. The Kremlin anticipated blitzkrieg, an easy takeover, Ukrainian forces surrendering en masse, and a new puppet government. But what they got is stiff resistance, stalled advances, and a rising body count, frankly, for Putin, it's embarrassing. Russia has seen widespread protests with thousands being arrested. So Moscow needs to control the narrative, and it's difficult with social media, especially when it's flooded with videos of surrendering Russian soldiers and destroyed equipment. So he's blocked them. And now media organizations like CNN, the BBC, and others are shutting down their operations because a new law that criminalizes anyone who goes against the Kremlin's narrative. So, for instance, even calling what's happening in Ukraine a war, that could land you in prison for up to 15 years. So what these harsh measures mean is Putin doesn't want the average Russian knowing the truth. Rather, he wants them to believe it's going as predicted, like he said yesterday. It's interesting, though, Ian, because even if you shut down things like Facebook and Twitter and, and foreign media and independent media, Certainly, the Russian people know in many ways because they can see the effects of, of some of these economic sanctions. They can see IKEA closing down. They know that, that the international community is not supportive of what is happening right now. And NATO's secretary general says that, that more hardships might, might be on the horizon. Some of the worst fighting, he said, he said is yet to come. So, uh, so tell us, what cities in Ukraine are most at risk of falling? And have we heard anything about a ceasefire or these humanitarian corridors to try and let civilians escape? Oh, yeah, we, we have heard from Ukraine officials, and they're trying to set up these corridors and the ceasefire so that they can operate. And, and they want to get the international community involved, so it is a bigger operation, more people are involved to ensure that these happen. Uh, and that's because, you know, as we've been watching, urban warfare is ugly. We've seen how it's been unfolding with entire apartment buildings knocked down, gutted, and in flames. And the worst part in all of this is the rising civilian casualties which is only getting higher. And we saw this again in Syria, where Russia and its allies bombarded cities into submission. And there are two in particular, Kharkiv and Mariupol, that are under intense fire tonight. Mariupol is completely surrounded. It's running out of food, medicine, water, and it's cut off from power. The mayor says it needs all those things, but desperately also needs reinforcements and that humanitarian corridor to evacuate some of the city's 400,000 residents. And despite agreeing to those corridors, Ukrainian officials accuse Russia of not living up to their word. Local officials in the captured city of Kherson, which is on the Dnieper River just north of Crimea, they say the Russian military isn't allowing 19 Ukrainian trucks with aid through and that they're told Russia will be providing the aid, Lana. Wow, Ian, thank you. The Biden administration says that there is an ongoing internal review to determine if Russia and Vladimir Putin's actions in Ukraine should be considered war crimes. CBS News.